Welcome back. Let's take a look back at what's making news headlines. President Cyril Ramaphosa has announced the lifting of the bans on the sale of alcohol and tobacco when the country enters level two of the lockdown at midnight on Monday. Alcohol sales at restaurants, bars and taverns will be allowed up to 10 p.m. Liquor outlets will be allowed to sell alcohol for off-site consumption from Monday to Thursday during the hours of 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. only. Family and social visits will be allowed and the ban on interprovincial travel has since been lifted. COVID-19 cases in South Africa have risen by 4,513. The total number of cases recorded in the country is now over 583,000. The health ministry also confirmed another 126 deaths last night, bringing the total to 11,677. In your sports, Orlando Pirates failed to close the gap on table-topping Kaza Chiefs last night when they drew nil all against Bidvers Wirtz in an APSA Premiership match at Emirates Airline Park in Johannesburg. Pirates are third on the log and are 10 points behind their Soweto rivals. The draw left Wirtz in fifth place. And uh, those were your headlines. Thank you so much for staying with us. Now, Bright Sparks Creative Play is a female-focused initiative that provides creative extramurals for toddlers in underprivileged schools in and around Cape Town. Their latest project is the transformation of a Cape Flat school that received an extensive facelift through a collaborative charity art project with the Ilukulukulu Collective and designer uh, Morag Maiskog. Now, Karen Stewart is the founder of Bright Sparks, and she joins us now via Skype to tell us more about the strides they are making in the mother city. A very good morning to you, Karen. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Welcome. Good morning. Tell us about what uh, Bright Sparks Creative Play is all about and the kind of work that you do there. Um, so we are an MPC, and we work with women primarily in underprivileged um, communities. We train them to be creative facilitators and then they run uh, extramural from their schools. So we work only with ECD teachers that are already qualified and the training we give them bolsters their um, skills, um, it bolsters their um, income um, and it also provides the children that they work with with extra stimulation um, once a week. So we've been doing this for four years now and we've got four schools that we established at. And um, it's been going really well. Every year um, we get more clients, um, our, our teachers are becoming more creative, uh, more engaged. Um, and so it's been a really exciting journey. And your team, I understand, consists of mainly women. Tell us why this was an important aspect and the opportunities you afford them. Um, so... The, the early childhood development center, uh, sector sorry, is very focused on women. Um, and we felt that um, it's a very important sector because these women are supporting our nation, actually, if you think about it. If it wasn't for them looking after small children every day, women wouldn't be able to go to work. That is the reality of the situation. So um, the work that we do supports those women because they actually have a very hard job. They get to work very early in the morning. They leave work very late at night. Um, they, they don't get remunerated, uh, remunerated very well. And um, so the work that we do actually really supports them, not only financially, but also we provide a lot of emotional support to women that are, are, are working under what is often hard um, circumstances. Um, they're not, they don't have a lot of psychological support. They're dealing with children in communities that are um, often experiencing uh, drug addiction and other very um, extreme uh, circumstances. So our work is, is very important because it, it provides these women with a safe space where they feel, feel held, where they are supported, and where they learn uh, to be real entrepreneurs and to reach out to their parents um, and, and to work with their children in, in a very creative and alive way. And how do you identify these uh, underprivileged women? And for those that are interested in coming on board, how do they go about doing that? 
In the past, we've always worked um, through uh, Northlink College. They, they train uh, teachers and they train principals. So we've always worked through principals because we need to have a very strong relationship with the principal of the school. Um, in order for us to be successful at that school, because we're working within that school system. So um, if the school's principal and leadership is not really top quality and, um, do, and, and if they don't have a good relationship with their staff, then our concept doesn't actually work. So the way that we've always identified our schools to work with is through reaching out to principals and then the principals come to us and they say, we'd love to have this concept at, at our school. And then we go in and we assess whether there's space for us to work and how the whole concept would actually land in that uh, in that particular space. Then we go ahead and we do the we do the training and we do the organizing and and we and we walk with those women. We've been walking with most of our women for four years. Some of our schools only two years, but we're there and we support them and we support what they do. And let's talk about the, uh, about the creative extramurals for toddlers uh, you provide in these underprivileged schools. What do you do exactly and which schools have you identified? Um, so we work with four schools currently. Um, where, uh, the Iluku Luka project where we did the, mur the mural project to upgrade the whole look of the school, um, that is in Tuscany Glen um, and the school is called Disneyland Educare. Um, we have a second school in Ravensmead called Sunset Educare. We have a third school in Athlone called um, Anantes Educare, and then a fourth one in Bridgetown, um, which is near Athlone, um, which is called Bridges. Um, so those are the four, four schools that we're currently working with. And how have the kids been responding to these creative extramural activities that you provide? The best. They love it. They get so excited. Every day they ask the teachers, is it Bright Sparks today? Is it Bright Sparks? <laughs> so, uh, no, the, the kids are the ones that are really also getting um, a huge benefit out of this. Um, our teachers often say to us, you know, the, the children that in, are in Bright Sparks, are, they, they ask more questions, they're more confident, they, um, they, they, they really engage in imaginary play in a, in a very vivid and, um, and creative way. And that's really what we're going for. We, we, we want those children to, to get those skills because we believe those skills are what creates entrepreneurs of the future. And that's really what we need in South Africa today. We need young people, and, and this is the best time to start with those young people before they even start school, um, to, to really uh, um, be innovative thinkers and to be brave and to learn how to fail and to have all of those kind of skills of resilience that entrepreneurs need. Yeah, speaking of entrepreneurship, is there a program or a robust program that deals with imparting life skills on these toddlers, uh, you know, to ensure that uh, they are internalized about some of the uh, daily realities that we face on a daily basis? Well, um, so Bright Sparks does address the, those issues to some degree. Um, and the way that we do it is through building resilience. So what that means is, we, we don't allow the teacher to be the one that's telling the child, this is how you must make this thing. The teacher is taught to create an open brief, which makes the child have to resolve problems and really um, go into themselves to discover the best solution to what the teachers ask them to do. So um, we emphasize diversity of materials, for example, so that there's a lot of choice for children. So they're not only given one material to make something out of, um, that they are encouraged to express themselves through their bodies in diverse ways, not the one way that the teacher is saying. And this is, this is very, very important because what it's doing is it's allowing the child to solve problems by themselves, unassisted by the teacher. Um, and it's, it's, I can't emphasize how important the skill is. And one of your latest projects you've done is the Lockdown School Makeover Charity Art Project that you did in the Cape Flats. Tell us more about that. Yes. 
So we worked with um, Brit a British designer called Morag myers Koff. Okay. She is um, very well known and she creates these very large um, uh, interactive spaces. And she does it through these exuberant colors and um, patterns. And her whole thing is to create a sense of place. So when people walk into a space, they feel a sense of belonging. Um, we worked with the Luku Luku Collective from Africa Burn. And this year they were going to build a five-story structure that has been designed by Morag Myerskov. And of course, when lockdown happened, um, the Africa Burn was cancelled. And we were initially going to inherit some of the panels, these beautifully richly painted panels um, that the Luku Luku Collective has been creating for the past two years. This project has been two years in the making. Um, and then Morag suggested to us that why don't we use the paint that was sponsored by Dulux and do a, a mural-based project instead of using the panels. So Sean Sebastian, who heads up the Luku Luku Collective and I, had um, a discussion. We then just went poof and we were like, okay, we're going to do this thing. We've got to, we are, everyone's feeling so depressed. We've got to do something in lockdown to make us feel better. We want to do something that's going to actually really improve the way that a bright sparks operate in the school by making the environment so much more creative to look at and to be in. So we started designing. It was all done on a very short time scale. We, um, we took two weeks to do, do the design. Morag was working on something else, and she came in and did, approved all the designs, changed our designs, tweaked them up, made them look absolutely gorgeous. Um, and we worked with the t uh, Tim Bopper's team, and they're incredibly professional um, mural painters. And we had four um, volunteers that came forward and worked for free on the project. And that was really amazing to have them there. Um, and then Daniel Conradi did all of the architectural drawings for us so that we could scale up that design so that it really looked perfect. Um, and we, we went into the school and it, because of lockdown, we were able to go into the school. This would have actually been quite difficult to achieve during normal school hours because, as I mentioned earlier, the working hours are very long and um, getting in there would have been problematic. So this way we had a whole week of uninterrupted time to go into the school and really do this project properly. So the painting work was done in four days, uh, which I think is actually pretty amazing. It is amazing and indeed. Andrew, and uh, Karen, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we have to end it there. Uh, but then thank you so much okay. for your time. I love your job, Karen. I really do. And the fact that you add a bright spark in a child's life really is heartwarming. And uh, keep up the good work. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the founder of Bright Sparks Creative Play, Karen Stewart. Uh, we've been talking to her uh, about the uh, lockdown extreme school makeover projects they've done in the Cape Flats. Let's take a quick